on today's show, an absolutely jam-packed edition of the podcast, talking about DeJounte Murray. Kevin Herter has not been traded to the Sacramento Kings. Aaron Holiday is coming. All kinds of things. DeLon Wright, unfortunately, is no longer on the Hawks roster. We'll touch on all of that stuff on what could be a very, very busy episode of the show. Please stay tuned, and here we go. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1273 of the Lofton Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Roland, coming to you on a Friday. It's July 1st, and it's very, very busy across the NBA landscape. Not only the Hawks, but uh, basically everyone is uh, very busy this time of year. But the Hawks have been very busy the last couple of days, and we'll touch on all of that. Uh, I almost recorded, almost recorded last night, June 30th. There was plenty to talk about. I could have gotten through an episode for sure with what was already out there. Uh, and, you know, since then, things have changed a little bit. The Hawks made a pretty big trade on Friday afternoon. They also had some other stuff happen. They signed a backup point guard. That's also intriguing. So we'll touch on all that stuff. It's going to be a solo podcast today, but a lot to get to. So my apologies if I fly through some of this stuff, but uh, type of transfer are what they are. I don't want to make sure I get up to everything on the show, but it's been a very, very busy day. In fact, I was walking into the Hawks facility on this Friday afternoon for the DeJounte Murray press conference, thinking I was going to leave with that on the podcast. And when I got there, uh, basically, when I was walking in the door, quite frankly, it was reported that Kevin Herter is no longer going to be on the Hawks roster. Now, the Hawks not announced this trade just yet, so it's not official official, but when Woj, when Woj tweets something, and it's later confirmed that I've heard it's done as well, you have to kind of take it as gospel for the most part. And uh, as of here, I'm recording this about 3.15 p.m. Eastern time on Friday, July 1st. Kevin Herter is headed to Sacramento for Justin Holiday, Mo Harkless, and a protected first-round pick. Before we get into the deal, the pick protections are also very notable here. It's a 2024 first rounder from Sacramento, but it's lottery protected. It becomes top 12 protected the following season in 2025 and then top 10 protected in 2026. And then crucially, it becomes two second round picks if it does not convey by the end of 2026. This is very similar to the Cavs and Thunder trades the Hawks have made in previous years. The Cavs trade was the Cal Corver deal. The Thunder pick that was coming from Oklahoma City was part of the Dennis Schroeder transaction. Those those, by the way, both became second round picks. This actually could as well for Sacramento, which is part of the calculus here. We'll come back to that in a second when it comes to the value. But obviously, I expected the Hawks to do something else with their roster. That's not a bit of secret. And the last few podcasts I've, I've done, and even on Twitter and things, I've said that basically the guys who I thought were the likeliest to be moved, they thought the Hawks made another move, were Kevin Herter and John Collins in some order. And clearly, I'll say this first about this trade. This is a talent downgrade in the near future for the Hawks. Kevin Herter is a better player than Justin Holiday. He's a better player than Mo Harkless right now. He's also younger and cost-controlled for longer. Uh, that's unfortunate for the Hawks. Obviously, you want to make a deal that gets you the best player on the trade. And, and this time around, the best player and the best asset, even when you include the first-round pick, the best guy, the best single thing in the trade is Kevin Herter, which is not usually the greatest thing in the world for the outgoing team. He is, of course, a totally solid starting caliber player at the shooting guard spot. Can play a little bit of three. Um, obviously, just signed a pretty, I would say, team friendly contract for four seasons. He's a valuable skill set with the shooting. He's a capable playmaker, and for me, an underrated defender. He has wing size. He's still very young. All that stuff checks a lot of boxes, and a lot of people like Kevin Herter around the league. I'm one of those people. I think he's a very valuable piece moving forward. And uh, for me, just to not bury the lead too much here, this is a move that I think pretty clearly has some some motivation of cost savings. Now we'll get into all the other factors as well, but I think it'd be pretty, pretty naive to think that this deal has nothing to do with money. I think it almost certainly does both present and future because Herter is signed for four seasons. And of course the Hawks want to lock up DeAndre Hunter potentially in the future, Trey Young, DeJounte Murray making a lot of money, et cetera. Capella's long-term deal. A Kong was coming pretty soon, all that stuff. And it looks like they want to move Herter for money reasons on some level. Uh, just to run through the numbers for you here, Herter is owed 14 and a half million dollars for the upcoming season. The season after that, of course, it goes up from there. But just for this season alone, fourteen and a half million for Kevin Herter. Uh, Justin Holiday is owed about six point three million on an expiring contract. It's only a one-year deal left for Holiday, but that's where he is. And Harkless is a shade under four point six million dollars, also on an expiring deal. So no long-term money, only one-year contracts for both Holiday and Harkless remaining. And overall, the Hawks save like four million dollars or so, something in that range on present day salary and also go from one player to two players. So even if you want to go even beyond that, um, filling a roster slot also saves you some money along the way there. So probably more like impact wise, five plus million dollars in luxury tax kind of savings. 
Now, this does not get them all the way out of the tax. I saw that report by somebody today. I'm not picking on that person because right now, yes, the Hawks do have less than the salary tax than the luxury tax number committed to salaries, but they only have 12 players on the roster. So if they were to actually fill out their team, and by the way, you have to have at least 14 players. If they do that with anyone, they will now be back over the tax. So they're not all the way out of the woods if the tax is the consideration for the Hawks. In fact, I did some math on this, um, and it kind of requires them to dump someone like Mo Harkless. But if they were to, let's just say, for only tax reasons, go to a team that has cap space and say, all right, we'll give you a second round pick to take Mo Harkless for free. If they were to do that and then fill the roster out with only minimum contracts, they would be under the luxury tax. Now, that's with nothing else. That's with only what they have on the roster now and some minimum guys beyond that. I am not reporting that's what they're that's what they're going to do. I'm saying if they only wanted to get out of the tax, they could they could have basically done that now with one more minor move on the periphery. Um, they have about 146.7.8, something like that, million dollars guaranteed for this coming season. That's with 11 players. Plus, they also have Jock, Land- Jock Landale's contract on a non-guarantee, which we'll come back to in a second, from the Spurs deal from Murray. They have Sharif Cooper as a free agent who is restricted. And they have Tyrese Martin, uh, who they drafted. And I would say either Cooper or Martin is probably going to be on a two-way contract. But if they wanted to have them both on very, very cheap minimum deals on the roster, they could also do that and sign somebody else to a two-way contract. So those guys I expect to be on the roster somewhere. We don't know w- where just yet. But for now, 11 guys on fully guaranteed contracts – plus Landale, plus Cooper, plus Martin. And uh, that's where we are at this point in time for the Hawks. Now, with all that out of the way, there is some basketball stuff to consider as well with this transaction. And it makes it a little bit more defensible because as I've said the entire time, fans should not really be rooting for the team to avoid the tax or even supporting those kind of moves. They're just only motivated by money. So that's that's, that's what I think anyway. I know some fans care about that stuff. You probably shouldn't. Um, but practically speaking, it does matter. Uh, Basketball-wise, the argument would be, of course, that you were sort of restocking the future of draft capital after you trade all the stuff for DeJounte Murray. You get a potential, I want to say potential, first-round pick back in this deal for Kevin Herter. And also, you get some depth. Justin Holiday is a real NBA rotation player. He's a good player. Uh, I know he's not as good as Kevin Herter in my mind, but Justin Holiday is a different kind of player, a little bit more of a uh, you know combo f- wing kind of guy, could play a little bit of three for you defensively. Uh, he's, he's a better defender than Herter. I think Herter is a better offensive player pretty clearly, but Holiday is a real guy. That's, that's not someone that's just a complete throw in. He should be in the rotation for the Hawks, and I think he will be in the rotation for the Hawks this season. Then you have a depth piece. In Harkless, who's not as good as Holiday, but is more of a combo forward type, can play more four, and uh, is more of like an adequate player. Uh, I've always liked Holiday a lot. Obviously, he's a former Hawk, and as we'll get to later on in this podcast, he's actually going to be playing with his brother, Aaron Holiday, who the Hawks also reportedly signed today. But Holiday on an expiring contract is totally solid. He's a pretty good shooter, 37% career from three, taking more threes in recent years. That's a good sign for him. Uh, defender, very solid as well. Point of attack guy, uh, probably their second best point of attack defender on the roster right now behind only Murray. Maybe you could argue Hunter as well, but that's definitely their top three point of attack guys in some order, Murray, Hunter, and Holiday. Uh, we'll talk, and we'll talk more about him in the future, but Holiday does give them a guy basically they can bank on being in rotation, and that is very helpful. Harkless is less interesting, I will say, as a player, but someone who I think is actually a real guy. Um, he's probably more of a minimum guy, and he's making more than the minimum in terms of what his impact is actually going to be. But he was, if he was a free agent and the Hawks signed him for the minimum, I would say, all right, pretty good signing. Um, he's 29 years old. He's a good defensive. He's a good defensive player. He's a pretty rugged guy at both spots, at the forward spots, mostly, mostly a four on offense. I've kind of thought the entire time that even if they were to keep John Collins, which might happen, it seems to be more likely with every passing day that they might do that and keep John Collins around. The Hawks were always going to have to bring somebody else in that could play some minutes at the four. I know Jalen Johnson is going to play some this year, and I I definitely advocate for that. I think Jalen Johnson's future is very bright. But the notion that the Hawks were going to go into the season with only Jalen Johnson as a backup four was never very likely. And I think Harkless will plug that hole if that's what they want him to do on this roster. The shooting is the question with Harkless. He really can't shoot at a high level, like a career 29% three-point shooter, something like that, something in the low 30s. I don't have that number in front of me, but it's very, very modest. I forgot to write that down, but alas, here we are. And uh, defensively, though, very, very solid and really just a veteran that knows how to play and won't kill you in in any fashion. So that's a very interesting part of this transaction, just getting two guys for the price of one in some respects. As far as the pick is concerned, this is the interesting part in a lot of ways, too, beyond just the the piece that Kevin Herter is leaving. Um, This is a real pick on paper, but it also could very easily not be a first round pick. So for most franchises, most franchises having three years to have one pick convey um, basically by making the playoffs once or even being like a fringe play-in kind of team once would be enough. But the Kings have not made the playoffs in a long, long time. It's a decade plus. It's the longest streak in the league without, without making the playoffs. 
And there is no guarantee Sacramento is going to be a team that is outside the bottom 10 for those three seasons in a row, or at least one of those three seasons. So it could become two second round picks. That would definitely knock the value of this trade. We won't know that for, you know, four or five years at this point in time. So it's kind of hard to evaluate that now, but just bake that in. It is possible this deal is never a first round pick in return. If it's not, the value of this deal is pretty bad for the Hawks. If it's a first round pick, then it becomes a lot more defensible in some ways. And we won't know that for a while, but because clearly from a value standpoint, you know, Justin Holiday is a real player, but value wise, a first round pick is worth more in the market than Justin Holiday is on an expiring contract. We'll just have to see if it's actually a first round pick in a few years. Um, Beyond that, a couple more things to sort of hit on quickly here. This does open up some some path for AJ Griffin in the future. People are asking me about that. I will say, short term, I would stress, and we have a podcast that I recorded already about AJ Griffin. It's going to probably run next week sometime before summer league starts. Um, I think I'm skeptical that he's going to play a lot of minutes as a rookie. In fact, he's not quite ready to play, I don't think, at this point. Long term, I love that draft pick. I talked about that a lot already on the show. But uh, as, as I always say, rookies are not usually very good. So opening up time for Griffin this year doesn't really help you all that much. But long term, certainly, uh, they, would, they would have some decisions to make on the wing. And you know, Griffin, probably more of a combo wing. He's a little bit bigger, obviously a lot stronger than Kevin Herter is. But um, certainly some future-facing playing time there for Griffin. And overall, I will say this is an interesting move. I don't think it's terrible. I also don't like it very much, if that makes sense. And part of that is because I'm pretty high on Kevin Herter. Um, I think he's a starter in the NBA long term. But for me, the, pro- the part that I really don't like even more is that it feels like it's a money move in some respects, which I kind of saw coming. I kind of warned people about that. I think the Hawks might try to stay under the tax, which would not be the greatest winning situation in terms of basketball stuff. But I will say if that was the mandate, and we don't know that for sure, if Tony Russell said, look, we're not paying the tax, and again, I'm saying that as a giant if right now, if that was the mandate, saving some money and doing this deal was not a bad way to do it in a vacuum because you do get a real guy back in Holiday. You get a very useful combo forward back in Harkless and in theory, a potential first-round pick in the future. And in a vacuum, getting a first, if that if that pick is a first-round pick, again, if that pick is a first-round pick, it's a totally fine value for Kevin Herter because Holiday is useful and because first round picks have some real currency. If that's second round picks, it's a bad, it's a bad value. So it's really that simple in some ways, but a uh, holiday helping them this year is very crucial to point out as well. And also that, that, you know, sort of getting that future facing pick when you're losing a few picks in the future is helpful. Of course, the argument against it is that Herter is the best player in the deal. As I said before, the best overall asset in the deal. Plus the Hawks have some shooting questions now kind of subtly. Um, when you remember that Murray, his biggest weakness on offense is his lack of perimeter shooting. Plus, you have two non-shooting centers. I know Okongwu, the hope is that he'll shoot long-term, but right now he's not. He's definitely still a question mark as a shooter. Holiday is a fine shooter. He's an average shooter, but he's definitely not as good as Herter as an offensive player overall or as a shooter. So there are some at least mild shooting concerns, at least until A.J. Griffin's ready to go as a bomber. Um, I will say, I definitely wish the best for Herter overall. I've really enjoyed covering Kevin Herter. Good guy by all accounts. A good player by all accounts as well in my mind. I think he's a starting level player. Have a good a good decent role in Sacramento. Uh, some time for him to shine. Maybe would have gotten squeezed a little bit in Atlanta. Although I was looking forward to maybe seeing some second units of Murray and Herter playing together, who actually fit pretty well. But um, I will say this. Uh, the rest of the offseason will be very interesting for the Hawks, as we'll get into later on a couple of things that have already happened. But we'll have more in the future on the rest of this offseason. And I'll say this now. The Hawks are going to need... Bogdan Magnanovich to A, stay healthy, and B, provide the value that he usually provides when he is healthy. Because without Herter, Bogey is the only guy on the roster that fills his role as a bomber from the perimeter, as a shooting guard to provide spacing. Um, obviously, defensively, he's slipped a little bit in recent years, but there is a lot of pressure now in my mind on Bogey as currently constructed on this roster because he's really the only guy, um, you know, in that kind of wing role, shooter, knockdown guy role. You know, Hunter can obviously shoot a little bit as well, but Bogey is by far, other than Trey, of course, the best shooter on the roster now, and they're going to have to have him healthy. And as a reminder, he had some work done in his knee in the offseason, so there's no guarantee he's even playing opening night. So that's interesting dynamic there that we'll cover, obviously, a lot more in the future. But that's all I got on the Kevin Herter trade. I want to open up with that. It became big news on Friday, and uh, we'll cover. We'll, I'm sure we'll cover that with more angles in the future. But uh, overall, wish the best for Kevin Herter, and we'll see if the Hawks can kind of uh, hold on to that value with that first-round pick, and we'll see how they integrate Justin Holiday and Mo Harkless in the future. Okay, we'll have much more to come on this podcast from Justin Holiday to Kevin Durant to DeLon Wright to Aaron Holiday, all that fun stuff. But first, a word from our sponsors on today's show. Today's show is brought to you by Arcade One Up. We have big news. The one and only NBA Jam is back. Arcade One Up is the leader in at home retro arcade games. And not only are they bringing back the best game ever, they've made it bigger than ever with a Shaq Edition machine. I've been a big NBA Jam guy for a long time, and this is just fantastic news. 
I'm not the only one that actually likes NBA Jam either. And I'm sure to tell our listeners, you can once again play hoops with NBA legends in the, in the arcade classic that is NBA Jam. Jump across the court, set the ball on fire in one of the first sports games ever to feature real and digitized NBA licensed teams. No fouls, no free throws, no quarters required. Compete with friends and family through all new Wi-Fi leaderboards, making you more connected than ever. And you can pre-order now. Yes, right now at Arcade1Up.com. That is Arcade, the number one up.com for an estimated early September ship date. Arcade 1Up is the place for fun. They have classes like the Golden Tee and Mortal Kombat and many others starting at just $3.99. And check this out right now. They're giving away a free NBA Jam Shack Edition to a Locked On listener. And you can enter it for a chance to win that game console for your house at Arcade1Up.com slash Locked On. That is Arcade, the number one up.com slash Locked On. You have until July 8th to enter to win that NBA Jam Shack Edition console. Don't miss out. Enter today at Arcade1Up.com slash Locked On. All right, more to get to now and a lot more to get to, quite honestly. But DeJounte Murray is where we'll, we'll go next. Um, the announcement for the deal was not, not, not was ever in doubt, but Thursday afternoon is when the announcement actually came that the Hawks were acquiring him. Travis Schlenk, who's not talked to the media in public, it's been all Andrew Fields recently. The quote from Travis in the release was, quote, the opportunity to acquire a player of DeJounte's caliber just entering his prime doesn't come along too often. He's developed into one of the elite two-way guards in the league, and we're thrilled to add him to our group. And also Travis says that he'd like to thank Gallinari for his professionalism and his contributions to the Hawks over the last two seasons, end quote. The press conference actually was just earlier today on Friday afternoon. Nothing in terms of like massive news uh, coming out of that. Uh, I'll just kind of tick off some boxes here. Murray seems very eager to play with Trey Young. Uh, no surprise there, of course, but they've been talking for two to three weeks is what Murray said. People kind of talk about how that how was tampering. Uh, it's not tampering. I'll say that right now. Players are allowed to speak to each other. If that had been a, if that had been Travis Schlenk, if that had been Landry Fields, that is tampering. Uh, but they cannot be sanctioned at all for Trey and DeJounte talking. So no, no, no problems there whatsoever. Murray said the exit from San Antonio was quote, mutual end quote, a couple of times. And Chris Kirster of the athletic was uh, rightfully pressing him on that and whether he asked for a trade Murray kind of sides up that, that question. I don't think it really matters too much. Clearly the Spurs are in rebuild mode and I'm sure they had a conversation. It's more of a back and forth between the two of them. Uh, the, the two sides, I should say Murray and the front office of San Antonio, but um, obviously he seems to be happy in Atlanta and very, very fine up to play with Trey young. Also, the entire thing was available um, on, to watch on Hawks.com or Bally. So I'm not going to play the entire video for you. It's like 30 plus minutes of video. But I did ask, I got one question in to DeJounte that I'm going to play the answer for you here. You'll hear my question. And it's actually about uh, Trey, Trey and the fit with Murray compared to how we uh, sort of fit with other guys in San Antonio. So here's my question and uh, you'll hear Murray's answer right now. Brad Rowland from Dime. I know you've played with a lot of different guards in San Antonio. Obviously, no one quite like Trey. How do you approach that on, on the court, knowing that you're playing with someone that is used to having the ball in his hands and playing alongside him? Uh, I mean, he's a guy who want to get better. Uh, he's great. You know, uh, he, he, he loves the game. He loves getting better. And like I said, he's a great person. You know, just for me, what I know of him, uh, even us being next to each other at All-Star, just talking and stuff like that, knowing him since high school, you know, he's just always been a great person. And then, like I said, the basketball side, he's just willing to get better and willing to learn. But a lot of people say, uh, you know, how is this going to work? Or, you know, DeJounte is a point guard, Trey's a point guard. He's used to having the ball. But, I mean, it shows that we're willing to give the ball up and make the team better. So that's a, a topic that, you know, I'm not hearing or seeing, uh, you know, having two guards that could play make and make their teammates better. And those are the teams who last, uh, you know, the ones who make everybody around them better. And uh, I think with Trey, he takes pride in that. You know, he's able to score the ball at a high level. And then on my end as well, you know, I I'm willing to give first. You know, I'm willing to do whatever the team needs me to do to win basketball games because I really want to win. And uh, that's that's the biggest thing. But like I said, I'm excited to, you know, play alongside him. All right, other than that, nothing else to really get to from the press conference alone. I will say, though, as a sidebar for the deal itself, the Hawks are going to be acquiring Jock Landale in the trade. Uh, he's a third center kind of guy who's 26 years old, played at St. Mary's. He's actually from Australia. Uh, diehard Hawks fans might remember that he was actually on the 2018 Summer League roster alongside Trey Young. Um, he actually played a lot on that team, was like I think the starting center on that roster most of that week. I talked to him a few times during that stretch, nice guy for the most part. Uh, he agreed sorry, he appeared in 54 games, made one start for the Spurs this year, was sort of their backup center for the most part, played about 11 minutes a game, um, could shoot a little bit. I think he's kind of an NBA quality, like third-ish center kind of guy. Um, also in a very useful contract. So Landale is, his deal is for $1.56 million for this year, which is basically the minimum. 
Uh, he's non-guaranteed, though, until the league-wide cutdown date of January 10th. Uh, he did get a little bit of a sweetener of uh, $46,120. Uh, of that had to be guaranteed to make the deal actually work, the trade work. So a little bit of a, a nice little freebie for Jock Lando. But uh, the Hawks can take a long look at him, um, both in the summer and also in training camp to see if he's a guy they want to keep around. They don't have to. I think it'd be totally okay if they didn't keep him around as the third center. But also, he probably is a quality enough third guy, especially if they go into the season with both Capella and Okongwu on the roster. If they do that, there isn't a lot of playing time. Obviously, Gorgie Jang last year was kind of the example of a guy who barely, very rarely played if there was any – time yeah, but I, i'll say this he had to play a little bit when it mattered but again it's like a very very small role particularly if they have collins as well on the team as a another backup five option uh lando might be a, a, appropriate for that role if they have capella Congo, and collins but we'll see and there's some value to having a non-guaranteed contract on your books a little bit cheaper for the luxury tax all that fun stuff um, people sort of just sort of wrap up the Murray deal itself in the trade. By the way, if you missed it somehow, I talked about it a lot on the emergency podcast, which dropped on Wednesday into Thursday. So that's my full thoughts. But sort of some synopsis here. We actually, I had three different people ask me for a sort of a one sentence wrap up of the trade. Um, so I'm going to do that now. Basically, what I would say is the Hawks give up a package that's probably befitting of a player that's a little bit better than Dejounte Murray is, but also he does in theory exactly what they wanted. Um, all offseason long. He's also 25 and cheap for two years, and he makes the team better in a lot of different ways. That is my synopsis. So maybe they overpaid a little bit. I totally get that. Um, I know Nate Duncan said this on, on his podcast, but he's probably um, the worst player, quote unquote, that's ever been traded in the modern era for three picks like this, and unprotected. But that doesn't mean he's a bad player. He's really, really good. And I talked about, talked about that a lot on the show on Wednesday. So that's my short synopsis, but uh, he does a lot of things. And I thought it was a sort of fitting that Landry Fields opened the presser on Friday by talking about just that, like how much they have these uh, theoretical needs on the roster of competitiveness and defense and secondary ball handling on offense, all that stuff. And Murray basically checks all those boxes that they've been talking about for a while. And uh, that's something that I would certainly echo as well. Also, one more thing before we move on from this. Uh, there were some questions about Murray and a potential contract extension. Uh, I'll give you the details on this now and why that's probably not going to happen. Um, basically, the most the Hawks are allowed to offer him because of NBA rules with contracts right now is a three-year extension for $68.9 million in base salary and about $5.8 million in incentives for a total of $74.7 million. That is less than $25 million a year, which is, of course, is a lot of money for a lot of people. I understand that. But for a guy who is playing at a near-max level, uh, that's not enough for him to take that. And sh so basically, in short, uh, no one thinks, including me, that that's going to get done because Murray has no incentive to take that deal. I know it's a lot of money. And if you're super risk averse, you could say, look, that's a lot of money, life changing stuff. I get that. But uh, no one in the league is like, yep, he's taking that deal. It's not going to happen. Now, the Hawks should absolutely offer that trade. Sorry, that that deal to him. In fact, it would stun me if Travis Schlank did not already offer it to him. Um, did you say, hey, DeJounte, I don't think you want to sign this, but if you want to sign it, here's a three-year deal worth the absolute max we can give you um, to extend on your contract. He's probably going to say no, and he probably should say no, but the Hawks should offer that deal if they haven't done that already. Um, a year from now, by the way, um, the Hawks can offer a four-year extension to Murray, but the problem is the same problem that it was before and that you cannot offer more in the first year, which means you're offering less overall because the raises have to go off of what was offered in the first year. So all that said... CBA nerd stuff to the side. The most likely result, no matter what, is that Murray hits free agency at the end of the 2023-24 season. Is that a problem? Maybe. We'll see. But the Hawks will have his bird rights. They can pay him whatever they want to to get him uh, locked in long-term if he wants to sign, but he will be unrestricted. So the Hawks cannot match a deal. There has to be that discussion. There's no like overlording thing other than the Hawks can offer the most years and the most dollars, which is usually very helpful for a player. Uh, but still, that's not a guarantee by any, by any means, and we'll see how that all works at that point in time. Also of interest to Hawks fans potentially is that Gallinari is waived already by the Spurs. He seems like he has a lot of suitors and might be signing with the Celtics as I'm talking now. Nothing has been official that I can see, but it uh, seems like he's going to be in Boston. I know that'll be tough for Hawks fans who uh, like uh, who like Gallo quite a bit to see him in the sort of rival uniform of Boston, but uh, a guy that I just definitely enjoy. I talked about him a lot on the last podcast. Okay, one more break now. We have more to talk about between Kevin Durant and DeLon Wright and Aaron Holiday. Rumor stuff, Scholar Mays, et cetera. That's all coming up on the podcast. But uh, first, one more break to hear from our sponsors on the show. 
Today's show is brought to you by Bet Online, and the madness never ends in the NBA. I can say that right now. It's been a very, very busy week, and Bet Online has been rapidly updating with all kinds of new odds and things to make your life interesting in the sports world. And the NBA draft, of course, is in the books now. Free agency is still actively happening as we speak. Some leagues coming. There's plenty of odds on that as well. And the projections for the future are flying around. And with that in mind, Bet Online is the place to be to fire away on the future's market. And then Bet Online is also the source for your sports betting needs right now and always. Find the latest odds, news, and developments across the sports world. That includes Stanley Cup final stuff, which already happened, of course. But hockey is always kind of interesting as well. It's one of those sidebar sports people are already interested in. They have baseball odds and scores. They have the latest fights. They have the next season's futures on NBA, NFL, NHL, college football, college basketball, and baseball. All that stuff all in one place. And Online is going to be source for your wagering avenues like live betting, esports, poker, and casino games and more. And they have other sports covered. I t- talked about, about hockey a second ago. They have golf. They have tennis, auto racing, rugby, lacrosse, table tennis, horse racing, soccer, cricket, cricket entertainment bets, and any sport you can think of. And Online has all of it in one place. And you can find it on your computer or mobile device to learn more about all the trends and the action in the sports world. Online, where the game starts. All right. So uh, Kevin Durant asked for a trade. <laughs> that happened in the NBA world. Uh a lot of chaos, people asking all kinds of questions about the Hawks and pursuits of Kevin Durant. And uh, some of that's because of Chris Kirscher and St. Mamic reporting the other day that while the Murray talks were happening, um, they cited sources saying the Hawks were at least monitoring Brooklyn about Kevin Durant before he even asked for that trade. That is not surprising. I think basically it would be malpractice for the Hawks not to monitor Durant because every team in the league, short of like the full-on rebuilding teams, and even then probably at least call, should be calling on Durant and trying to figure it out. Um, I will say... Uh, it's you know the Hawks can make a credible offer, which, which we'll come back to in the future. It'll, I will also say that what I hear right now is that the Hawks are not exactly on the short list for Kevin Durant. Um, I think it's at least plausible. It's a non 0.0 percent chance, so I have to at least mention it because people are asking me all kinds of questions, and I totally get it. Uh, early reporting, by the way, is that he prefers Phoenix or maybe Miami, uh, but he's signed for four years, and the Nets could send him wherever they want to send him. Now, usually, a player of Durant stature does not get sent to where he does not want to go, but uh, it's a different circumstance with four years of team control still on the books. So I think the Hawks would have had a better chance at Durant if they had uh, not done the Murray deal. So that's kind of just the reality there because there's the picks that they could have offered in that swap. But also you could say that Murray adds to the attractiveness for Durant side as a player that's already going to be helping the Hawks win. But they have pieces that could be interesting. Let's just say that at the very top. Um, they're going to have to match salary. Durant makes $44 million this next season. Um, but they have guys that can match salary. Um, obviously, Herder's off the board now after that trade, but they still have Hunter, Collins, Capella, and Bogdanovich all making in that like mid-teens to mid-20s numbers that are very useful for salary match purposes on a guy for the max. Um, like Collins and Bogey, for instance, make about $42 million combined. That's a, that would work under the CBA rules. So money's not a problem for the Hawks matching if they needed to do that. Now, from there, they have guys who are young and cost-controlled, like a Kong Wu, like Jalen Johnson, like A.J. Griffin, who could be very useful in throw-ins. Also, the Hawks have two first-round picks that they're allowed to trade, 2023 and 2029. Uh, those are One of those is a long way out, obviously. But they can't trade 2024 or 28 because of the Stepien rule that does not allow you to trade picks in back-to-back years. They can swap those picks, as they did in 2026 with the Spurs, if they wanted to make that deal more attractive. So they have a they have some picks. They have some young players. They have some interesting players that are already good, like Collins, Capella, etc. cetera. Um, I do, though, kind of doubt the Hawks have the best offer, uh, unless they just kind of put everything on the table, which they could do in theory. Um, but it seems like uh, based on the odds that are out there in the betting world or the perception and the reporting, not usually on the short list. Um, in fact, Bet Online, our friends at uh, Bet Online, released odds about Durant's next team on Friday earlier today as I'm recording this. And the Hawks were not listed at all. It was the Suns, the Heat, the Raptors, the Pels, the Grizzlies, the Lakers, the Wizards, the Sixers, the Warriors, the Clippers, the Knicks, and the Thunder in that order. So, I don't know. It's not impossible. The Hawks do have the assets to make a very, very credible offer. I don't know if they will actually get close to it, but it's at least on the table in terms of something that's like not completely insane. From there... Not a Durant thing, but some, some Hawks fans were immediately asking about Ben Simmons if they can't get Kevin Durant because Simmons has been linked to the Hawks in the past. First, uh, Sam Amick at the Athletic reported that the Brooklyn actually expected to keep Ben Simmons, and that's probably what they should do because he's not his value is pretty low right now until he actually plays. Um, also, I will say, I've talked about Simmons a lot for the Hawks in the past, but the fit is not great for Ben Simmons on the current Hawks roster. For one thing, he and Capella don't work together. Uh, for one thing also, 
Uh, Murray and Simmons are not a great fit together because Murray's shooting challenges. Um, I get the intrigue, but they're already kind of short on shooting. Um, you know, Ben Simmons is still a really good player. So if you can get him, you can get him, but uh, not the most cleanest fit in the world, just to answer those questions that were coming in today. Now we move to the transactions that have kind of already happened that it will impact the Hawks, both outgoing and incoming. Uh, first, it's a farewell to my guy, DeLon Wright. So if you're listening to the podcast for a long time, you will know that DeLon Wright is my guy. I've always loved DeLon Wright. I said that before he got, before he actually started playing for the Hawks. Uh, when they acquired him during the season, I was advocating for him to play more um, when he wasn't playing during the playoff run when he was awesome, all that stuff. Uh, so it's kind of tough, obviously, but uh, two years and $16 million guaranteed for DeLon from the Washington Wizards. That is a perfectly solid contract for DeLon Wright. He's worth that money. He's a very viable player. He's a versatile player. He can work basically anywhere. Also, um, great character guy, etc. Not a star or anything. Even, even, even I know he's not a star. I get that. But it was nice to see him have that little breakout in the playoffs. And I think it was pretty silly the way the Hawks handled him at times last year, playing him behind Lou, taking him out of rotation. I've made fun of that a lot. I stand by all of that stuff. But I will say it's totally fine for the Hawks to not match this deal or at least succeed this deal. And by the way, they didn't have met, they did not have match right. They had, they had his bird rights. They could pay him whatever they wanted to, but they, they couldn't just stop him from leaving if he wanted to leave. I think it would have been solid to good for the Hawks to just pay this up themselves. But obviously the money is a concern for the tax that they were concerned about that. And uh, if he signed for a cheap deal elsewhere, I would be uh, raising a little bit more ruckus, but this is a deal where he's paid appropriately. So I'm not like upset about that part. And once the Hawks made the Murray deal, my confidence level that Wright was going to come back was a lot lower just because of a lot of factors. Number one, the money factors. Number two, um, I definitely knew he had a real market, so I was not going to be uh, think he's going to come back for very cheap. And obviously, the Hawks were playing to use Murray as the backup point guard quite a bit this year. Um, so DeLon could have still had a role for sure as someone who could play defense on the wing and do a lot of different things. Um, but still, especially without without Herter now, it could have helped them even more. But I think that him going to get a more secure role in Washington behind Money Morris, who they also traded for, makes a lot of sense. I can't blame him for that. And uh, I really enjoyed DeLon uh, as a player, as a, as a guy that I've talked to, and I wish him well in D.C. So uh, you know, nothing else to really add there. Obviously, a bittersweet farewell for me uh, more than anybody, but uh, keep, keep getting them checks, DeLon, and uh, certainly we'll be following him up with the Wizards. Uh, also, Kevin Knox is no longer a Hawk. Two years and $6 million total from Detroit. That was probably what I thought he was going to get, something in that range, more than the minimum, maybe down to the minimum kind of thing. Uh, Troy Weaver likes athletic pedigree guys. He signed Marvin Bagley to a big deal, for instance. Uh, he, he went and got New Orleans Noel, uh, Hamadou Diallo, et cetera. Like Weaver has a kind of a player type that he likes. Kevin Knox kind of fits that. I think it's a pretty good value deal for Detroit. Uh, Knox is not someone who's like ready to be a really good rotation player right now, but he's still very young and uh, has some talent as a former lottery pick. So uh, he won't be returning to the Hawks. And then from outside the organization, the Hawks are going to be signing Aaron Holiday to a one-year deal. Sham Sarani reported that on Friday morning that uh, later confirmed by Lauren Williams of the AJC, who actually reported it's going to be a minimum deal for Aaron Holiday. Um, 25-year-old point guard, will be 26 years old in September, former first-round pick in 2018. Again, that same draft as Young and Herter. Has played for Indiana, Washington, and Phoenix in his career. Um, played under Nate McMillan, actually, with the Pacers, which is probably notable at this point in time. And the last year was splitting time between Washington and Phoenix. He is pretty small, 6 feet, 185 pounds, listing. Uh, that kind of list limits him a little bit overall. But he's a competitive defender, and he's pretty fine on that end of the floor, just totally fine for, for a point guard kind of thing, better than Trey. Not a great, not a game changer, but totally solid. Um, can't really play him with Trey much, if at all, and he probably wouldn't want to necessarily, but um, gives them that sort of plug-and-play veteran type. Pretty good shooter, career 37% from three, 38% last year. Not a good two-point guy. Not a good finisher around the rim at all. So more of a, you know, as, as a lot of small guards had that problem, he is one of those guys that has that problem. Metrics are kind of split on him as to whether or not you know, so he's more of a backup point guard type, obviously. But um, I will say he played pretty well in Phoenix when he got, when he got there, posted some of uh, his highest assist marks of his career. Uh, not a great facilitator, though, I will say. like As a point guard, not a guy who's going to run a ton of pick and rolls. Like he's gonna, He's more of a supporting piece offensively. Um, and I think that you could play him some with Murray. That would actually might work a little bit. But and I actually thought that he and Herter might make sense in the backcourt together. Um, play him with Bogey would make some sense as well, just for having some more shooting, some more playmaking a little bit. Not a pure point guard type by any means. But the way that I would say this for Aaron Holiday, by the way, is a guy that I like. I think he's totally fine uh, backup point guard. I think that the Hawks were always going to, as I've said before on the show, by the way. Um, bring in at least one more backup point guard type, whether it was going to be DeLon or somebody else in a veteran mold. It was not going to only be Sharif Cooper behind Trey Young and DeJounte Murray. 
that's all I kind of knew about it. They were trying to look at somebody in the market, whether it be Holiday or somebody else. Um, from what I understand, though, it was always going to be a minimum guy. So unless it was DeLon Wright, they were not going to assign resources to the backup point guard job because Murray's going to be playing a lot of point guard. There might be nights when Holiday doesn't play at all, and that's totally fine. So that's a minimum role. It's a one-year minimum, minimum contract. And uh, when you view it through that lens, they were not going to do much better, if at all, than Aaron Holiday. I think Aaron Holiday for a one-year minimum is a good signing, flat out. Is he perfect? Definitely not. Um, if they have an injury to Trey or DeJounte, are they going to have maybe some times where it's a little bit dicey? Potentially, but that's kind of the deal when you're paying what you're paying for, obviously for Trey. But even then, when you're going to clearly use Murray as the on-ball guy when Trey's off the floor, um, this role is just so small that you really can't give resources to it. You also And players know. Like I'm sure DeLon knew this. I'm sure Aaron Holiday knows this, that the role on paper is not very big in this spot. But anyway – I think it's totally fine. And if you view it through that through that lens, it makes sense. And by the way, if you are a huge Sharif Cooper fan, which by the way, I like Sharif Cooper quite a bit, great value, draft pick, all that stuff. Um, if Sharif is just so good that you have to play him, there is no shame in that. And there's no reason why he can't play over, over Aaron Holiday. My only point is there was no way that they were going to go in with only Sharif, who is completely unproven at the NBA level. Obviously had some success, success in the G League this year. I like the pedigree. I like the talent. But NBA-wise, Sharif is definitely a question mark. So uh, if Sharif is just so good in training camp, preseason, et cetera, that he has to force his way into a role, that's a good problem to have. You can kind of just bury Aaron Holiday if you have to. But uh, that makes sense to me. I think Aaron Holiday was an above-average guy that they could sign for the one-year minimum deal as that third point guard type on this roster. Okay, from there, uh, as I'm recording this, uh, Adrian Wojnarowski just reported that Rudy Gobert is going to Minnesota. So that's a crazy one. I was actually going to mention this right now. The timing on that is impeccable. But Tim McMahon of ESPN reported earlier today on Hoop Collective on the podcast that the Hawks were never really in the mix for Rudy Gobert and something that was ne that actually never had legs. And uh, I was going to say that out loud on the podcast, just kind of acknowledge it. And again, uh, going to Minnesota as I'm recording this, holding my phone and doing multitasking at this point in time. Tis the season here on July 1st. Cross Rudy Gobert off your list. If you are a Hawks fan holding out for that, that ain't happening at this point. Uh, before we get out of here, a couple more things. Um, Skylar Mays, people are asking about this. this. is obviously not a high-profile thing right now with all the stuff going on, but I just wanted to mention it here on the podcast. I talked about Sharif Cooper being tenored a qualifying offer earlier this week, but Skylar Mays did not get a qualifying offer from the Hawks, meaning he is now an unrestricted free agent. I've always liked Mays. If you recall that he was actually given a rest-of-season contract this year by the Hawks at the end of the year. They removed him from this two-way contract, and that meant the Hawks had to offer him at least a minimum contract to actually make him restricted, and they did not do that. The Hawks could still sign him. That is conceivable, but they did not go ahead and offer him that deal now. So Mays could leave if he wants to for the first time. He's actually unrestricted. Go, go wherever he wants. I think Mays is an NBA player. Uh, I don't think he's a starter long-term. I don't think he's probably even like a top three or four guard in the roster long-term. He's probably more of a supporting piece in a lot of different ways, but I think he's an NBA player and he, and he, and he hopefully will sign somewhere. I've always enjoyed Skylar as well, but keeping that in mind for housekeeping purposes at this point in time. One final thing before I get out of here and maybe I'll come back, come back later on <laughs> on the podcast, but uh, summer league stuff, of course, coming later. Uh, we're, we're about a week away from summer league. Um, the Hawks actually have a game that I talked about earlier. They, they announced their schedule and their last schedule game is Thursday, the 14th against the Spurs. That game is moving from 3, from 3 PM to 4 PM. So keep that in mind. And uh, as a wrap up here on the show, people are asking me, of course, now what's next for the Hawks. Um, my question is, I don't know. It would not totally stun me now if they were to just run it, with this roster for the most part and fill around it with minimums, um, either maybe another wing as a minimum guy, et cetera, and keep Collins. I think um, this is the lowest confidence that I've had in a John Collins trade in about two weeks. Um, earlier, I was a little bit lower. I, wrote, I rose a lot because the Hawks were really putting him out there in trades. And now it seems like it is genuinely on the table that they that may not trade John. Now they might still do it. Um, it would not surprise me at all if they were still active on the margins right now, but uh, we'll see. Um, as a point of clarity for the next few days of content, if the Hawks make a transaction or something big happens on Friday night, or maybe Saturday morning, I will have a quick podcast about that when it happens. From there, I'm actually traveling the rest of the weekend into next week. I will definitely have a podcast Sunday or Monday, even if nothing else happens, just to kind of set the stage for where we are going to summer league, all that stuff. I, have a, I, I talked about this before, but I have an AJ Griffin podcast. It's sort of already in the bank. I'm hoping to talk to somebody about DeJounte Murray in the future. So we have some stuff going no matter what, but uh, keep that in mind. If there is uh, a little bit of a delay on a podcast over the weekends, because I'm on the road and then I'm going from there on the road to elsewhere on the road for, for summer league, and all that stuff in Las Vegas. So I'll be out and about recording from, from different locations, hotels, et cetera, in a couple of days and weeks, 
but uh, keep patience with me on that front. And uh, this is a podcast that I believe is going to go, I don't know, at least 40 plus minutes as I'm talking to you individually, right? Probably even closer to 45 at this point. But uh, keep that all in mind as well. Uh, I've covered a lot of ground in the last few days. It's the seventh podcast of the week. So we're trying to give you all we can do on the show. And by the way, I said this on Twitter, but I'll say it again now. This is June, I should say, was the largest month traffic-wise, download-wise, attention-wise in the history of the podcast. And also last week, the last week of June was also the biggest week in the history of the podcast. So thank you very much for all the support on the show, whether you are a, just a listener or a watcher on YouTube or both and trying to support the podcast no matter what. Uh, follow us on Twitter for sure. Moving forward at Lockdown Hawks, follow me on Twitter at BT Roland. But I really do support, uh, sorry, thank you for the support on the podcast. And I please also encourage you, if you have not done this already, to, to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, any of those places that you like to consume podcasts. And of course on YouTube as well. I really, really appreciate it, everybody. That's all I got for today. I'm, I'm spent on this Friday, July 1st afternoon, and we'll have more coming in the future, I'm sure. So keep it locked, subscribe. We'll see you next time.